Chapter 17, Respiratory Disorders Features of respiratory disorders in children are Worldwide, they cause more than 750,000 deaths per year in children 1 month to 5 years old. In the UK, they account for half of consultations with general practitioners for acute illness in young children and a third of consultations in older children. They are common and collectively responsible for about 25% of acute pediatric admissions to hospital in the UK. Asthma is the most common chronic illness of children childhood in the UK. 1 in 11 children in the UK receives treatments for asthma. Modern management of cystic fibrosis has markedly extended life expectancy. Presentation of respiratory disorders in children is with upper respiratory tract symptoms of coryza, sore throat, earache, sinusitis, or strider, lower respiratory tract in symptoms of cough, wheeze, and respiratory distress. As children, Especially infants have compliant chest walls and poorly developed respiratory muscles. They are particularly susceptible to respiratory failure and early detection and prevention are the cornerstone of management. Infants may develop signs of respiratory distress from most respiratory disorders. Its features are moderate tachypnea, tachycardia, nasal flaring, use of accessory respiratory muscles, intercostal and subcostal recession, heat retraction, and inability to feed, severe cyanosis, tiring, Severe symptoms include cyanosis, tiring because of increased work of breathing, reduced conscious level, oxygen saturation less than 92% despite oxygen therapy. Oxygen saturation monitoring is helpful to detect hypoxemia and to titrate the amount of additional oxygen required. Respiratory support, either non-invasive or occasionally invasive ventilation, may be required. However, signs of respiratory distress may become less marked when children become exhausted. Children who are particularly susceptible to respiratory failure include extreme preterm infants with bronchopulmonary dysplasia, those with hemodynamically significant, con significant congenital heart disease, or disorders causing muscle weakness, cystic fibrosis, or immunodeficiency. Susceptibility to specific acute respiratory infections varies with age. Physiology of Strider and Wheeze A review of the respiratory physiology explains why Strider from extrathoracic airway obstruction in the trachea and larynx is predominantly inspiratory and Wheeze from the intrathoracic airway narrowing is predominantly expiratory. Inspiration is an active process in which the contraction and downward movement of the diaphragm combines with the upward and outward movement of the ribs to generate a negative pressure in the thoracic cavity which sucks air into the lungs through the tube of the extrathoracic airways. A gradient of negative pressure is formed from the alveoli to the upper airway within the thoracic cavity the airway walls are pulled outwards by the negative intrathoracic pressure above the thoracic inlet when the external pressure is atmospheric the negative pressure within the airways lead to a degree of inward collapse during inspiration the reverse happens during expiration when the recoil pressure of the chest wall generates a positive intrathoracic pressure and pushes air out from the alveoli to the upper airway compressing the intrathoracic airways but distending the extrathoracic airway these changes are accelerated during any form of airway obstruction since the pressures generated to overcome the obstruction are even higher. As a result, obstruction to the extrathoracic airways is worse during inspiration, whereas obstruction to the intrathoracic airways are worse during expiration. Snoring is also inspiratory, but because it is caused by variable partial upper airway obstruction, it is a rough inspiratory noise, known as a strator. Narrowing of the airway due to inflammation is a feature of many respiratory pathologies. Upper airway narrowing results in increased effort and added respiratory noises during inspiration. Strider is harsh but musical while less whilst snoring strator is rough and lacks a single note. Lower airway narrowing results in increased effort and added respiratory noises during expiration, such as crepitations and wheeze. Upper respiratory tract infection. Children have a median of five upper respiratory tract infections per year in the first few years of life, but some toddlers and primary school age children have as many as 10 to 12 per year. Approximately 80% of all respiratory infections involve only the nose, throat, ears, and all sinuses. The term URTI embraces a number of different conditions. The common cold, also known as, known as coryza, sore throat, which includes pharyngitis and tonsillitis, acute otitis media, or sinusitis, which is relatively uncommon. The most common presentation in is a child with, combi with a combination of these conditions. Cough may be troublesome, and in URTI, may be secondary to post-nasal drip or attempts to clear upper airway secretions. 
URTIs may cause difficult in, difficulty in feeding in infants as their noses are blocked and this obstructs breathing, febrile seizures, or acute exacerbations of asthma. Hospital admission is rarely required but may be necessary if feeding and fluid intake is inadequate. The common cold, also known as coryza, this is the most common infection in ch of childhood. Classical features include a clear or mucopurulent nasal discharge and nasal blockage. The most common pathogens are viruses, rhinoviruses of which there are more than 100 different serotypes, coronaviruses, and respiratory sensitive virus, RSV. Health education to advise pa parents that colds are self-limiting and have no specific curative treatment may reduce anxiety and save unnecessary visits to doctors. Pain is best treated and par with paracetamol or ibuprofen. Antibiotics are of no benefit as a common cold is viral in origin and secondary bacterial infection is very uncommon. Cough may persist for up to 4 weeks after a common cold. Sore throat, pharyngitis, and tonsillitis. In pharyngitis, the pharynx and soft palate are inflamed and local lymph nodes are enlarged and tender. It is usually due to a viral infection, mostly adenovirus, entero enterovirus, as well as rhinovirus. In the older child, group A beta hemolytic streptococcus is a common pathogen. Tonsillitis is a form of pharyngitis where there is intense inflammation of the tonsils, often with a purulent exudate. Common pathogens are group A beta hemolytic streptococci and the Epstein Barr virus, infectious mononucleosis. Group A beta hemolytic streptococcus can be cultured from many tonsils, however, it is uncertain why it causes recurrent, recurrent tonsillitis in some children but not in others. Although the surface exudates of the tonsils seen in infectious mononucleosis are reported to be more membranous in appearance compared with bacterial tonsillitis, it is, in reality, it is not possible to dis distinguish clinically between viral and bacterial causes. Marked constitutional disturbance such as headache, apathy, and abdominal pain, white tonsillar exudate, and cervical lymph adenopathy is more common with bacterial infection. Antibiotics, for example, penicillin 5 or erythromycin, if there is penicillin allergy, are often prescribed for severe pharyngitis and tonsillitis, even though only a third are caused by bacteria. They may hasten recovery from streptococcal infection in order to eradicate the organism completely and prevent rheumatic fever. 10 days of antibiotic treatment is required for pharyngitis or tonsillitis. Rarely, in severe cases, children may require a hospital admission for intravenous fluid administration and analgesia if they are unable to swallow solids or liquids. Amoxicillin is best avoided as it may cause a widespread maculopapular rash if the tonsils are tonsillitis is due to infectious mononucleosis. Occasionally, group A streptococcal infection results in scarlet fever, which is most common in children aged 5 to 12 years. Fever usually precedes the presence of headache and tonsillitis by 2 to 3 days. The appearance of the rash is variable, although a typical appearance will include a sandpaper like maculopapular rash with flushed cheeks and perioral sparing. The tongue is often white and coated and, many, uh, and may be sore or swollen. This is the only childhood eczema caused by a bacterium and requires treatment with antibiotics penicillin 5 or erythromycin to prevent complications including acute glomerular nephritis or very rarely in high income countries rheumatic fever it is not possible to distinguish clinically between viral and bacterial tonsillitis Acute otitis media. Most children will have at least one episode of, of acute otitis media. This is most common at 6 to 12 months of age. Up to 20% will have three or more episodes. Infants and young children are prone to acute otitis media because their eustachian tube are short, horizontal, and function poorly. There is pain in the ear and fever. Every child should with a fever must have his or her tympanic membranes examined. In acute otitis media, the tympanic membrane is seen to be bright red and bulging and loss of the normal light reflection. Occasionally, there is acute perforation of the eardrum with pus visible in the external canal. Pathogens include viruses, especially respiratory sensitive virus and rhinovirus and bacteria including pneumococcus, non-typable hemophilus influenza and morazella catarralis. Serious complications are mastoiditis and meningitis, but these are now common. Pain should be treated with an analgesic such as paracetamol or ibuprofen. Regular analgesia is more effective than intermittent as required and may be needed for up to a week until the acute inflammation has resolved. Most cases of acute otitis media resolve spontaneously. Antibiotics marginally shorten the duration of pain but have not been shown to reduce the risk of hearing loss. 
A reasonable approach is to give the parents a prescription but ask them to use it only if the child remains unwell after 2-3 to three days. Amoxicillin is widely used. Neither decongestions nor antihistamines are beneficial. Recurrent ear infections can lead to otitis media with effusion, also called glue ear. Children are usually asymptomatic apart from possible decreased hearing. The eardrum is seen to be dull and retracted, often with a fluid level visible. Otitis media with effusion is very common between the ages of 2 to 7 years, with peak incidence between 2.5 years to 5 years of age. It usually resolves spontaneously but may cause conductive hearing loss, as shown on pure tone audiometry possible in more than four years old or flat trace on tympanometry hearing testing in younger children. Cochrane reviews have shown no evidence of long-term benefit from the use of antibiotics, steroids, or decongestions. Otitis media effusion is the most common cause of conductive hearing loss in children and can interfere with normal speech development and result in learning difficulties in school. In such children, insertion of ventilation tubes, grommets, is often performed, but benefits do not last more than 12 months. In practice, children with current recurrent UTIs and URTIs and chronic otitis media with effusion and glue ear that does not resolve with conservative measures often also undergo grommet insertion. If pr problems recur after grommet extrusion, then reinsertion of grommets with adjuvant aden adenoidectomy is often advocated, as there is some evidence that adenoidectomy can offer more long term benefit. Summary of otitis media. Otitis med acute otitis media is diagnosed by examining the tympanic membrane. Antibiotics marginally shorten the duration of pain but do not reduce hearing loss. If recurrent, may result in otitis media of effusion, which may cause speech and learning difficulties from hearing loss. Sinusitis. Infection of the paranasal sinuses may occur with viral URTIs. Occasionally, there is a secondary bacterial infection with pain, swelling, and tenderness over the cheek from infection of the maxillary sinus. As the frontal sinuses do not develop until the late childhood, frontal sinuses is frontal sinusitis is uncommon in the first decade of life. Antibiotics and analgesia, antibiotics and analgesia are used for acute sinusitis. Tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy. Children with recurrent tonsillitis are often referred for removal of their tonsils, one or more one of the most common operations performed in children. Many children have large tonsils, including usually reaching a maximum size at about eight years, but this in itself is not an indication for tonsillectomy as they shrink spontaneously in late childhood. The indications for tonsillectomy are controversial and must be balanced against the risk of surgery, but include recurrent severe tonsillitis as opposed to recurrent URTIs, tonsillectomy reduces the number of episodes of tonsillitis by a third, for example, from 3 to 2 per year, but is unlikely to benefit mild symptoms. A peritonsillar abscess, Quincy, and another indication is obstructive sleep apnea. The adenoids will also often be removed. Like the tonsils, adenoids increase in size until about the age of 8 years and then gradually regress. In young children, the adenoids grow proportionally faster than the airway, so that their effect on narrowing the airway lumen is greatest between ages 2 to 8 years. They may narrow the posterior nasal space sufficiently to justify adenoidectomy. Indications for the removal of both the tonsils and the adenoids are controversial but include recurrent otitis media with effusion with hearing loss where it gives a significant long-term additional benefit or obstructive sleep apnea which is an absolute indication. Strider. Strider is a harsh musical sound due to a partial obstruction of the lower portion of the upper airway including the upper trachea and the larynx. The causes of acute strider are listed in box 17.1. By far the most common cause is laryngeal and tracheal infection, where mucosal inflammation and swelling can rapidly cause life-threatening obstruction of the airway in young children. The severity of upper airways obstruction is best assessed clinically by characteristics of the strider, none only on crying at rest or by physic, and the degree of chest retraction, none only on crying or at rest. Severe obstruction also leads to increasing respiratory rate, heart rate, and agitation. Central cyanosis, drooling, or reduced level of consciousness such as impending complete airway obstruction. The most reliable objective measure of hypoxemia is by measuring the oxygen saturation by pulse oximetry, but in contrast to lung disease, it's a late feature of upper airways obstruction. Total obstruction of the upper airway may be precipitated by examination of the throat using a spatula. One must avoid looking at the throat of a child with upper airways obstruction unless full resuscitation equipment and personnel are at hand.
Group. Viral croup accounts for over 95% of laryngeal tracheal infections. Parainfluenza viruses are the most common cause, but other viruses such as rhinovirus, RSV, and influenza can produce a similar clinical picture. Croup typically occurs from 6 months to 6 years of age, but the peak incidence is in the second year of life. It is most common in the autumn. The typical features of coryza and fever are followed by hoarseness due to inflammation of the local vocal cords, a barking cough like a sea lion due to tracheal edema and collapse, harsh strider, variable degree of difficulty breathing with chest retraction, the symptoms often start and are worse at night. When the upper airway obstruction is mild, the strider and chest recession disappear when the child is at rest and the child can usually be managed at home. The parents should observe the child closely for signs and of increasing severity. The decision to manage the child at home or in hospital is, inf is influenced not only by the severity of the illness, but also by the time of the day, ease of access to hospital, the child's age with low threshold for admission for those of less than 12 months old due to their narrow airway caliber, and parental understanding of of, and confidence about the disorder. Inhalation of warm, moist air is a traditional and widely used therapy, but it has not been shown to be beneficial. Oral dexamethasone, oral prednisolone, or nebulized steroids budesonide reduce the severity and duration of croup and are the first line therapy for croup causing chest recession at rest. They may be shown they have been shown to reduce the need for hospitalization. In severe upper airways obstruction, nebulized epinephrine, adrenaline with Oxygen by face mask provides rapid but transient improvement. The child must continue to be observed closely for two to three hours after administration and as the effects wear off. Intubation of viral croup has become extremely unusual since the introduction of steroid therapy. Some children have a pattern of recurrent croup which may be related to atopy. Acute epiglottitis. In acute epiglottitis, there is intense swelling of the epiglottis and surrounding tissue surrounding the associated with septicemia. It, it is a life-threatening emergency due to the high risk of respiratory obstruction. It is, it is caused by the Haemophilus influenza type B, HIP. In the UK and many other countries, the introduction of universal HIP immunization in infancy has led to more than 99% reduction in the incidence of epiglottitis and other invasive HIP infections. Epiglottitis is more common in children aged 1 to 6 years but affect all age groups. It is important to distinguish clinically between epiglottitis and croup as they require quite different treatment. The onset of epiglottitis is usually very acute, high fever in a very ill, toxic looking child, and an intensely painful throat that prevents the child from speaking or swallowing, saliva drills down the chin, soft inspiratory strider, and rapidly increasing respiratory difficulty over hours. The child sitting immobile upright with an open mouth to optimize the airway. In contrast to viral croup, cough is minimal or absent. Attempts to lie the child down or examine the throat with a spatula or perform lateral neck x-ray to identify a swollen epiglottis and surrounding tissues must not be undertaken as they can precipitate total airway obstruction and death. If the diagnosis of epiglottitis is suspected, urgent hospital admission and treatment are required. A senior anesthetist, pediatrician, and ear, nose, and throat surgeon should be summoned and treatment initiated without delay. The child should be transferred directly to the intensive care unit or anesthetic room and must be accompanied by senior medical staff in case respiratory obstruction occurs. The child should be intubated and under controlled conditions with a general anesthetic. Rarely, this is impossible and urgent tracheostomy is life-saving. Only after the airway is secured should bloods be taken from culture and intravenous antibiotics such as sulfuroxime started. The tracheal tube can usually be removed after 24 hours and antibiotics given for 3 to 5 days. With appropriate treatment, most children recover completely within 2 to 3 days. As with other serious hemophilus influenza infections, prophylaxis with rifampicin is offered to those close household contacts. Bacterial tracheitis pseudomembranous group. This Rare but dangerous condition is similar to severe epiglottitis in that the child has a high fever, appears very ill, and is rapidly progressive airways obstruction and copious thick airway secretions. This is typically caused by infection with Staphylococcus aureus. Management is by intravenous antibiotics and intubation and ventilation if required. 
other causes of strider. When a child with acute strider presents with atypical features or a poor response to treatment, other causes need to be considered. If a child has an abrupt onset of strider without apparent infection, consider anaphylaxis or inhale a foreign body. Chronic strider is usually due to structural problem, either from intrinsic narrowing or collapse of the laryngeal tracheal airway, subglottic stenosis, laryngeal malacia, um, floppy, which is known as floppy larynx, or external compression, for example, vascular ring, lymph nodes, and tumors. Investigations are required to determine the cause. Basic management of acute upper airways obstruction is Reduce anxiety by being calm, confident, and well-organized. Observe carefully for signs of hypoxia or deterioration, agitation or fatigue or drowsiness or cyanosis. Provide oxygen if required and tolerated. Do not examine the throat with a spatula. It may precipitate upper airway obstruction. Oral nebulized or intravenous steroids are beneficial in croup and have similar speed of onset, 90 to 120 minutes. If severe, administer nebulized epinephrine adrenaline and contact an anesthetist. Uh, if respiratory failure de develops from increasing airways obstruction, exhaustion, or secretions blocking the airway, urgent tracheal intubation is required. Wheeze. Acute wheeze is due to the partial obstruction of the intrathoracic airways. This is from milk. Causal inflammation and swelling and is as in bronchiolitis or bronchial constriction as in asthma or a mechanical obstruction. For example, with foreign body or mucus, it may occur as a combination of all three. Bronchiolitis. Bronchiolitis is the most common serious respiratory infection in infancy. 2-3% to of all infants are admitted to hospital with the disease. Each year during annual winter epidemics, 90% are agreed are age not 1 to 9 months, uh, RSV is the pathogen in 80%, the remainder are accounted for by parainfluenza virus, rhinovirus, adenovirus, influenza virus, and human metanumovirus. There is evidence that co-infection with more than one virus, particularly RSV and human metanumovirus, may lead to more severe illness. Coriser symptoms precede dry cough and increasing breathlessness. Feeding difficulty associated with increasing dyspnea is often the reason for admission to hospital. Recurrent apnea in a is a serious complication, especially in young infants. Infants born prematurely who develop bronchopulmonary dysplasia or with other underlying lung disease such as cystic fibrosis or have congenital heart disease are not at risk from examining bronchiolitis. The Characteristic findings on our examination are dry wheezy cough, tachypnea and tachycardia, subcostal and intercostal recession, hyperinflation of the chest, fine and needle inspiratory crackles, high pitch wheezes, expiratory more than inspiratory. Investigations and decision to admit. Pulse oximetry should be performed on all children with suspected bronchiolitis. No matter investigations are routinely no other investigations are routinely recommended. In particular, X chest x-rays or blood gases are only indicated if respiratory failure is suspected. Hospital admission indicated if any of the following are present. Apnea observed or reported. Persistent oxygen saturation less than 90% when breathing air. Inadequate oral fluid intake. 50 to 75 percent of usual volume, severe respiratory distress, grunting, marked chest resection, or a respiratory rate over 70 breaths per minute. Management. This is a supportive. This is supportive. Humidified oxygen is either delivered by a nasal cannula or using a head box. The concentration required is determined by pulse oximetry. The infant is monitored for apnea. No evidence for reduction, reducing severity of illness duration has been shown from use of mist nebulized hypertonic saline antibiotics, corticosteroids, or uh, nebulized bronchodilators such as subutamol or ipratropium. Fluids may need to be given by nasogastric tube or intravenously associated assisted ventilation in the form of non-invasive respiratory support with CPAP, continuous positive airway pressure, or else mechanical ventilation is required in a small percent a small percentage of infants admitted to hospital. RSV is highly infectious and infection control measures, particularly good hand hygiene, cohort nursing, and gowns and gloves have been shown to prevent cross-infection to other infants in hospitals. 
Most infants recover from the acute infection within two weeks. However, as many as half will have recurrent episodes of cough and wheeze. See the following section. Rarely, usually following adenovirus infection, the illness may result in permanent damage to the airways, bronchiolitis, obliterans. Prevention of bronchiolitis. A monoclonal antibody to uh, RSV, palanvizumab, given monthly by intramuscular injection, reduces the number of hospital admissions in high-risk preterm infants. Although 17 babies need to be treated to avoid one admission, its use is limited by cost and the need for, example, for multiple intramuscular injections. Asthma. Asthma is the most common chronic respiratory disorder in childhood, affecting at least 1 in 11 children in the UK. Worldwide, there has been a significant increase in the incidence of asthma over the last 40 years, although this has now plateaued in many high-income countries. Although the symptoms of asthma are readily controlled in most children, it is an important cause of absence from school, restricted activity, and anxiety for the child and family. There are still about 20 deaths from asthma in children each year in the UK. Diagnosing asthma in preschool children is often difficult. Approximately half of all children wheeze at some point at some time during their first three years of life. In January there are three patterns of wheezing. Viral episodic wheezing. Wheezing only in response to viral infections. Multiple trigger wheeze in response to multiple triggers and which is more likely to develop into asthma over time or asthma. Viral episodic wheeze most wheezy preschool children have viral episodic wheeze. This is thought to result from small airways being more likely to narrow and obstruct due to inflammation and apparent immune responses to viral infection. This gives, con this gives the condition its episodic nature being triggered by viruses that cause common cold. Studies have found that sufferers not only uh, sufferers often have reduced small airway diameter from birth. Risk factors include maternal smoking during and or after pregnancy and prematurity. A family history of asthma or allergy is not a risk factor, uh, but a family history of viral wheezing is common. Viral episodic wheezing is more common in males and usually resolves by 5 years of age, presumably from increase in airway size. Multiple trigger wheeze and asthma. Some children, both preschool and school age, have frequent wheeze triggered by many stimuli, not just viruses, but also cold air, dust, animal dander, and exercise. This has been called multiple, trig multiple trigger wheeze. In the preschool age group where a formal diagnosis of asthma may be unjustified, this distinction is helpful as many children of this group benefit from asthma prevented therapy and a significant proportion go on to have asthma. When recurrent wheezing is associated with symptoms between viral infections, interval symptoms, and evidence of allergy to one or more inhaled allergens such as house dust mite, pollens, or pets, it's called atopic asthma. Atopic asthma. Evidence of allergy may be accompanied by positive skin prick testing, presence of IgE on blood testing. Atopic asthma is strongly associated with other atopic diseases such as eczema, rhinoconjunctivitis, and food allergy, and is more common in those with family history of such diseases. A small number of persistent or recurrent wheezing children will have other causes such as non-atopic asthma. Other causes of recurrent wheeze are listed in box 17.2. Pathophysiology of asthma. An outline of the pathophysiology of asthma is shown in figure 17.8. Causes of recurrent or persistent childhood wheeze. Viral episodic wheeze, multiple trigger wheeze, asthma, recurrent anaphylaxis, uh, chronic aspiration, cystic fibrosis, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, bronchiolitis obliterans, tracheal bronchiomalacia. Clinical features of asthma. Asthma should be suspected in any child with wheezing on more than one occasion, particularly if there are interval symptoms. It is more common in children with personal history of atopy. Although it may be clear to most clinicians what wheezing is, children and parents do not always mean the same thing. It is best to describe the sound, for example, a whistling in the chest when your child breathes out and ask that ask if that fits with the child's symptoms. Ideally, the presence of wheeze is confirmed or auscultation by a health professional to distinguish it from transmitted upper respiratory noises, which are often loud and easy to hear in children. Asthmatic wheeze is a polyphonic multiple pitch noise coming from the airways. It is believed to re represent many airways of different sizes vibrating from uh, abnormal narrowing. Key features associated with a high probability of child having asthma include Symptoms worse at night in the early, and in the early morning. Symptoms that have non-viral triggers. Interval symptoms, in other words, symptoms between acute exacerbations, 
personal or family history of an atopic disease, positive response to asthma therapy. Once suspected, the pattern of phenotype should be further explored by asking how frequent are the symptoms, what triggers the symptoms, specifically are sport and general activities affected by the asthma, how often is sleep disturbed by the asthma, how severe are the interval symptoms between exacerbations, how much school has been missed due to asthma. Examination of the chest is usually normal between attacks. In long-standing asthma, there may be hyperinflation of the chest, generalized polyphonic expiratory wheeze with a prolonged expiratory phase. Onset of the disease in early childhood may result in Harrison's sulci. Evidence of eczema should be sought as through examination of the nasal mucosa for allergic rhinitis. Growth should be plotted but is usually normal unless the asthma is extremely severe. The presence of wet cough or sputum production, finger clubbing or poor growth such as a condition characterized by chronic infections such as cystic fibrosis or bronchiectasis. Investigations. In younger children, asthma is usually diagnosed from history and examination alone. Parental description of the symptoms and response to treatment is the cornerstone to diagnosis. Sometimes, specific investigations are required to confirm the diagnosis or determine the severity or phenotype in more detail. Skin prick testing is uh, for common allergens may be performed to aid a diagnosis of atopy and to identify allergens which may be acting as triggers. A chest x-ray usually shows normal a chest x-ray is usually normal and not necessary unless other conditions need to be excluded. If there is uncertainty in the diagnosis or disease severity needs to be monitored peak expiratory flow rate PFR may be measured or spirometry performed Peak flow is less sensitive to changes in airway caliber than spirometry, but is portable and therefore helpful for serial measurements. Most children over the age of 5 years can use a peak flow meter or undertake spirometry. Poorly controlled asthma leads to increased vari variability in peak flow, with both diurnal variability, morning usually lower than evening peak flow, and day-to-day -day variability. Spirometry involves measurement of false expiratory volume in one second, blowing out as hard as, and as fast as possible FEV1. This provides a non-invasive measure of flow through the larger airways to the bronchioles. Often, response to a bronchial dilator is the most helpful investigation. This can be demonstrated as an improvement in the peak flow rate of or in a FEV1 before and after inhaling bronchial dilator. An improvement of 12% or more confirms bronchodilator reversibility and is characteristic of asthma. Following treatment, the re reversibility often reduces or disappears completely. Management. Medications used to treat children with asthma are shown in Table 17.2. Bronchodilator therapy. Inhaled beta-2 agonists are the most commonly used and most effective bronchodilators. Short-acting beta-2 ag agonists, often called relievers such as sabutamol or terbutalin, have a rapid onset of action. Maximum effects after 10 to 15 minutes are, are effective for 2 to 4 hours and have few side effects. They are used as required for increased symptoms and in high doses for which asthma, uh, high doses for acute asthma attacks. By contrast, long acting beta 2 agonists such uh, LABAS, such as Sermatorol or Fometorol, are effective for 12 hours. They are not used in acute asthma and should not be used without inhaled corticosteroids. LABAS are useful in exercise induced asthma. Ipratropium bromide, an anticholinergic bronchodilator, is sometimes given to young infants when other bronchodilators are found to be ineffective or if the treatment of severe acute asthma. Prevented therapy, inhaled corticosteroids. Prophylactic drugs are effective only if taken regularly. Inhaled corticosteroids, often called preventers, are the most effective inhaled prophylactic therapy. They decrease airway inflammation, resulting in decreased symptoms, asthma exacerbations, and bronchial hyperactivity. They are often used in conjunction with an inhaled LABA or leukotriene receptor antagonists. They have no clinically significant side effects when given in low dose, although they can cause mild reduction in height velocity, but this is usually followed by catch-up growth in a late childhood. Systemic side effects including impaired growth, adrenal suppression, and altered bone metabolism may be seen with high doses uh, if when high doses are used. The reduce to reduce risk of unwanted side effects treatment with 
inhale corticosteroids should be always should always be at the lowest dose possible. Treatment for many children is effective at very low doses. Always monitor the growth of children with asthma, especially if taking regular inhale or oral corticosteroids. Add-on therapy. The first choice of add-on therapy in a child over 5 years is a LABA, whereas uh, in children under 5 years, an oral leukotriene receptor antagonist such as Montelukas is recommended. The latter can also be used in older children when symptoms are not controlled by addition of LABA. Slow release oral theophylline and other alternatives, however, is high incidence of side effects, vomiting, insomnia, headaches, poor concentration, so it is not often used in children. Other therapies. Oral prednisolone usually given on alternate days to minimize the adverse effect of growth is uh, to uh, minimize the adverse effect on growth is required only in severe persistent asthma where other treatment has failed. All children of this, this therapy must be managed by a specialist in childhood asthma. Anti-IgE therapy and omalizumab is an injectable monoclonal antibody that acts against IgE, the natural antibody that medicates allergy. It is used for the treatment of severe atopic asthma and should also be administered by a specialist in childhood asthma. Most antibiotics are of no value in the absence of a bacterial infection are, and neither cough medicines nor decongestions are helpful. Antihistamines, for example, loratidine and nasal steroids are useful in the treatment of allergic rhinitis. The British guideline on asthma management uses a stepwise approach starting treatment with the step most appropriate to the severity of the asthma and aiming for optimal control of symptoms. Complete control is defined as the absence of daytime or nighttime symptoms, no limit on activities including exercise, no need for reliever use, normal lung function and no exacerbations need the need for hospitalization or oral steroids in the previous six months. Treatment increases from step 1, mild intermittent asthma, to step 5, chronic severe asthma, requiring continuous or frequent use of oral steroids, stepping down when control is good. Allergen avoidance and other non-pharmacological measures. Although asthma in, in many children is precipitated or worsened by specific allergens, complete avoidance of the allergen is difficult to achieve. The value of identifying such triggers by history or as an allergy testing is controversial. Most, students, most studies of allergen avoidance have been disappointing, although dust might impermeable matches covers may be beneficial in some children. Allergen immunotherapy is effective for treating atopic asthma due to a single allergen, but its use is limited by the risk of systemic allergic reactions associated with the treatment. Parents should be advised about the harmful effects of cigarette smoking in the house. Although exercise improves general fitness, there is no evidence that physical training improves asthma itself. Psychological intervention may be useful in chronic severe asthma, acute asthma. Assessment. With each acute attack, the duration of symptoms, the treatment of it ar already given, the cause of previous attacks should be noted. Clinical features which lead to be which need to be determined are shown in figure 17.11. Criteria for admission to hospital. Children require hospital admission if high dose inhaled bronchodilator therapy. Uh, they have not responded adequately uh, clinically. For example, there is persisting breathlessness or tachypnea, uh, or they are becoming exhausted, or still have a marked reduction in their predicted uh, usual best peak flow rate or FEV1 have a reduced oxygen saturation of less than 92% in air. A chest x-ray is indicated only if there are unusual features, for example, asymmetry on chest signs suggesting pneumothorax, lobar collapse, or signs of severe infection. In children, blood gases are only indicated in life-threatening or refractory cases and often are normal until the child is in extremis. Management Acute breathlessness is frightening for both the child and the parents. Calm and skillful management is the key to their reassurance. High dose inhale bronchodilator steroids and oxygen from the foundation of therapy form the foundation of therapy of severe acute asthma. Management is summarized. As soon as the diagnosis has been made, the child should be 
given oxygen if the oxygen saturation is less than 92%. All children should be given a beta-2 bronchodilator. The dose and frequency increasing according to severity of the attack. The child's age and response to therapy. It should be given via spacer as used by the child at home unless the attack is severe to life-threatening when a nebulizer driven by high flow oxygen may be indicated. The addition of nebulized ipratropium to the initial therapy in severe asthma is beneficial. A short course of 3 to 7 days of oral prednisolone expedites recovery from moderate to severe acute asthma. Inhaled therapies are not always uh, are not always successful as the drugs may be de delivered in sub suboptimal doses to areas of the lung that are poorly ventilated. Intravenous therapy therefore has a role in the minority of children who fail to respond adequately to inhaled bronchodilator therapy. Magnesium sulfate, aminophylline, or intravenous salbutamol are all potentially ben beneficial. Magnesium sulfate probably has the least side effects and most evidence of that benefit and is increasingly being used as the first line first choice for intravenous therapy. For intravenous aminophylline, a loading dose is given over 20 minutes followed by continuous infusion. Seizures, severe vomiting, and fatal cardiac arrhythmias may follow a rapid infusion. If the child is already on oral theophylline, the loading dose should be omitted with both aminophylline and sabotamol. The ECG should be monitored and blood electrolyte checked. Uh, antibiotics are only given if there are clinical features of bacterial infection. Occasionally, these measures are insufficient and mechanical, ve mechanical ventilation is required. Patient education. Prior to discharge from the hospital after an acute admission, the following should be reviewed with the child and family. When drugs should be used regularly or as required. How to use the drug inhaler technique. Which, what each drug does, relief versus prevention, how often and how much can be used, frequency and dosage, what to do if asthma worsens, a written personalized asthma plan, management action plan should be compiled. The child and parents need to be aware that increasing cough, wheeze, breathlessness, and difficulty in walking, talking, and sleeping, or decreasing relief of from bronchodilators all indicate poorly controlled asthma. Some asthmatics find it difficult to identify gradual deterioration. Measurement of peak flow rate at home allows either earlier recognition. Patients with troublesome asthma are usually given a supply of oral steroids to keep at home with details in the asthma action plan on when to start them. Outcomes are better for children with asthma who have a package of educational measures but no single component has been shown to be beneficial in isolation. Follow-up arrangements need to be made. The periodic assessment of the child with asthma is outlined in figure 70.6. Other causes of acute wheezing. The most common cause of acute wheeze is an acute attack of asthma or viral episodic wheeze. In infants and toddlers, it is also present in bronchiolitis. Other causes are atypical pneumonia. Although pneumococcal pneumonia rarely causes wheezing, atypical pneumonia caused by mycoplasma, chlamydia, or adenovirus can do so. Foreign body inhalation, abrupt onset of cough followed by wheeze is a previous in a previously well child on passing below the glottis of Foreign body generally impacts in the main or lobar bronchus and may initially cause unilateral wheezing and air trapping. A chest x-ray performed during expiration will show persistent hyperinflation of the lung distal to the obstruction. Eventually, airway swelling causes complete obstruction and lobar collapse is seen. Anaphylaxis Suspect if acute urticaria, facial swelling, strider, or previous reaction to an allergen. The management of anaphylaxis is shown in figure 6.11. Cough. Acute cough. Cough is the most common symptom of respiratory disease. Identifying if the cough is dry or moist can be helpful diagnostically. A dry cough with a prolonged expiratory phase suggests that there is some narrowing of small size to moderate size airways. A barking cough suggests a degree of tracheal inflammation, narrowing or collapse. A moist cough suggests that there is either increased mucus secretion or infection in the low, lower airway. The cough reflex functions to expel unwanted material from the airway below the glottis. It is most uh, in most children, episodes of cough are due to tracheal bronchial spread of URTIs caused by the common cold virus and do not indicate the presence of long-term or serious underlying respiratory disease. Whooping cough or pertussis. This is a highly contagious respiratory infection caused by Bordetella pertussis. It is endemic with epidemics 
Every three to four years, after a week of coryza cataraphase, the child develops a characteristic paroxysmal or spasmodic cough, followed by a characteristic inspiratory whoop paroxysmal phase. The spasms of cough are often worse at night and may culminate in, culminate in vomiting. During a paroxysm, the child goes red or blue in the face and mucus flows from the nose and mouth. Mouth. The whoop may be absent in infants, but apnea is common at this age. Epistaxis and subconjunctival hemorrhages can occur after vigorous coughing. The paroxysmal phase lasts up to three months. The symptoms gradually decrease, convalescent phase, but may persist for many months. Complications such as pneumonia, seizures, bron and bronchiectasis are uncommon, but there is still a significant mortality, particularly in infants who have not yet completed their primary vaccinations at four months. Infants and young children suffering severe spasms of cough or cyanotic attacks should be admitted to hospital and isolated from other children. The organism can be identified early in the disease from the culture of a pernasal per swab. Although PCR polymerase chain reaction is more sensitive, characteristically there is a marked lymphocytosis more than 15 times 10 power of 9 per liter on blood count. Although macrolide antibiotics eradicate the organism, they decrease symptoms only if started during the cataral phase. Siblings, parents, and school contacts may develop a similar cough and close contacts should reserve a macrolide prophylaxis. Unimmunized infant contacts should be vaccinated. Immunized, immunization reduces the risk of developing pertussis and the severity of disease in those affected, but does not guarantee protection. The level of protection declines steadily during childhood. Reimmunization of mothers during pregnancy reduces the risk of pertussis in her infant during the first few months of life when it's particularly dangerous. It is currently recommended in the UK this followed by re-emergences of pertussis in infants in the community. Summary. Pertussis is caused by border teller pertussis, paroxysmal cough followed by inspiratory whoop and vomiting in infants. In infants. Apnea rather than whoop, which is potentially dangerous. Diagnosis is through culture of organism on par paranasal swap. Uh, marked lymphocytosis on blood film. Persistent or recurrent cough. Children often have persistent or recurrent cough. By far, the commonest reason for this is that the child has had a series of respiratory tract infections. However, some infections such as pertussis, NRSV, and mycoplasma can cause a cough that persists for weeks or months. In about half of children with acute cough, the symptoms will settle by 10 days, but in up to 10%, it will persist for up to 25 days. A cough that lasts more than 8 weeks or more, or, or one that has not improved after 3 to 4 weeks, should be considered persistent in the absence of recurrent URTI. Persistent cough after an acute, infect after an acute infection may indicate unresolved low bar collapse, which may be demonstra not demonstrable on chest x-ray. Persistent bacterial bronchitis, see the following section, or superative lung disease. Most children will swallow rather than expectorate sputum if the cough is wet, surrounding uh, sounding like there is excess sputum in the airways, or if the cough is productive, further investigation is required. In any child with severe persistent cough, tuberculosis should be considered. Asthma is another common cause of recurrent cough, although there is usually an associated wheeze and breathlessness. Sometimes the wheezing is not recognized or not described accurately. Identifying wheezing or auscultation during an acute episode is helpful to make the diagnosis. However, many children with persistent cough without wheeze are treated incorrectly as having asthma. If the clinical features are not subjective of asthma or if initial asthma treatment is not beneficial, other diagnoses should be considered or the child referred to respiratory pediatrician. Other less common causes are listed in box 17.3. Aspiration of feeds may cause cough and wheeze. This may be caused by gastroesophageal reflux or as a result of swallowing disorders. For example, in children with cerebral palsy, inhaled foreign bodies need to be considered when a cough has not resolved, especially if there is a persistent radiological abnormality. There may not be a clear history of choking. Only in 50% of children with inhaled foreign body will a choking episode be recalled. The significance of prenatal smoking uh, the significance of parentals, parental smoking on children is generally underestimated. If both parents smoke, young children are twice as likely to have recurrent cough and wheeze than in non-smoking household. 
households. In older, in the older child, active smoking is an important factor. Currently, six percent of eleven to fifteen year olds and ninety percent, nineteen percent of sixteen to nineteen years old year olds smoke regularly. Causes of persistent re or recurrent cough, recurrent respiratory infections following specific respiratory infections, for example, pertussis, respiratory syncytial virus, mycoplasma, asthma, persistent lobar collapse, lobar collapse following pneumonia, uh, superative lung disease, for example, cystic fibrosis, ciliary dyskinesia, or immune deficiency, recurrent aspiration, plus minus gastroesophageal reflux, persistent bacterial bronchitis, inhaled foreign body, cigarette smoking, active or passive, tuberculosis, habit cough, airway abnormalities, for example, tracheal bronchomalacia, tracheal esophageal fistula. Some older children and adolescents develop a barking, unproductive habit cough following an infection or an asthma attack. The cough characteristically disappears during a sleep and is dry in nature. A reassurance or an explanation after a thorough examination are usually effective. Pneumonia. The incidence of pneumonia peaks in infancy and old age but is relatively high in childhood. It is a major cause of childhood mortality in low and middle income countries. It is caused by a variety of viruses and bacteria, although in over 50% of cases no causative pathogen is identified. Viruses are the most common cause in young children, whereas bacteria are the most common in older children. In clinical practice, it is difficult to distinguish between viral and bacterial pneumonia. The most common pathogens causing pneumonia vary according to the child's age. Newborn Organisms from the mother's genital tract, particularly group B strep, but also gram negative enterococci and bacilli. Infants and young children, respiratory viruses, particularly RSV, are most common, but bacterial infections include Streptococcus pneumoniae or Haemophilus influenza. Bordetella pertussis and Chlamydia trachomatis can also cause pneumonia at this age. An infrequent but serious cause is Staphylococcus aureus. Children over 5 years, Mycoplasma pneumoniae. Uh, Streptococcus pneumonia and Chlamydia pneumophilia are the main causes. At all ages, mycobacterium tuberculosis should be considered. There has been a marked reduction in the incidence of pneumonia from hemophilia influenza since the introduction of heap immunization. A polysaccharide conjugate vaccine, Prevnar 13, with immunogenic genicity against 13 of the most common serotypes of streptococcus pneumonia responsible for invasive disease is now included in the routine immunization schedule in the UK and many countries. Initial results show in young children a decrease in septicemia, meningitis, and severe rhinosinusitis, but not in bacteria, bacteremic pneumonia. Clinical features Fever, cough, and rapid breathing are the most common presenting symptoms. These are usually preceded by a URTI. Other symptoms include lethargy, poor feeding, and an unwell child. Some children do not have a cough at presentation. Localized chest, abdomen, or neck pain is a feature of pleural irritation and suggests bacterial infection. Examination reveals tachypnea, nasal flaring, and chest enjoying. In contrast to asthma, the most sensitive clinical sign of pneumonia in children is increased respiratory rate, and pneumonia can sometimes be missed if the respiratory rate is not measured in a febrile child, so-called silent pneumonia. They may be an inspiratory cause crackles over the affected area, but the classic signs of consolidation with dullness on percussion, decreased breath sounds, and bronchial breathing over the affected area are often absent in young children. Oxygen saturation may be decreased. A chest x-ray may confirm the diagnosis but cannot reliably differentiate between bacteria and viral pneumonia. In younger children, a nasopharyngeal aspirate may identify viral causes, but blood tests including full blood count and acute phase reactants are generally unhelpful in differentiating between viral and bacterial cause. In a small proportion of children, the pneumonia is associated with a pleural effusion where there may, may be blunting of the costophrenic angle on the chest x-ray. Some of these effusions develop into empyema and fibrin strands may form leading to septations. Management Evidence-based guidelines for the management of pneumonia in childhood have been published by the British Thoracic Society. Most affected children can be managed at home, but indications for admission include oxygen saturation less than 92%, recurrent apnea, grunting, grunting and or an ability to maintain, inability to maintain adequate fluid or feed intake. 
general supportive care should include oxygen for hypoxia and analgesia if there is pain intravenous fluid should be given if necessary to correct dehydration and maintain adequate hydration and sodium balance physiotherapy has no proven role the choice of antibiotic is determined by the child's age and the severity of illness. Newborns require broad spectrum and intravenous antibiotics. Most older infants can be managed with oral amoxicillin with broader spectrum antibiotics such as colmoxiclav reserved for complicated and unresponsive pneumonia. For children over 5 years of age, either amoxicillin or oral macrolide such as erythromycin is the treatment of choice. There is no advantage in giving intravenous rather than oral treatment in mild or moderate pneumonia. Small paraneumonic infusions occur in up to one third of children with pneumonia and may resolve with appropriate antibiotics, but persistent fever despite 48 hours of antibiotics, such as a pleural collection, which requires drainage. This should be done with ultrasound guidance. The percutaneous placement of a small ball chest drain and regular installation of a fibronolytic agent to break down the fibrin strands are usually effective, but more aggressive interventions such as video-assisted thoracoscopic surgery or even trachotomy and decortication is sometimes necessary in refractory cases. Prognosis and follow-up. Follow-up is not generally required for children with simple consolidation on chest x-ray and who recover clinically. These, those with evidence of low bar collapse or atelectasis should have a repeat chest x-ray after six, four to six weeks to check that the lung fields look normal. Virtually all children with pneumonia, even those with empyema, make a full recovery. Consider pneumonia in children with neck stiffness or acute abdominal pain. Chronic lung infection. Any child with a persistent cough that sounds wet, i.e. sounds like there is excess putum in the chest or is productive requires further investigations. Persistent bacterial bronchitis, where there is persistent inflammation of the lower airways driven by chronic infection, is an increasingly recognized is increasingly recognized as a cause of chronic wet cough in children. Common organisms are Haemophilus influenza, Morazella, Morazella catarellis and Morazella cataralis. It may be a precursor, precursor to bronchiectasis investig if investigations and treatment are not instituted. Referral to specialists in pediatric respiratory disorders is indicated. Bacterial growth from sputum or bronchial lavage is consistent with the diagnosis. Treatment is with a high dose of antibiotics such as colmexiclav coupled with physiotherapy. Another cause is bronchiectasis, permanent dilation of the bronchi. It may be uh, generalized or restricted to a single lobe. Generalized bronchiectasis may be due to cystic fibrosis, primary ciliary dyskinesia, immunodeficiency, or chronic aspiration. Focal bronchiectasis is due to previous severe pneumonia, congenital lung abnormality, or obstruction of a foreign body. A plain chest x-ray shows may show gross bronchiectasis, but often it is not possible to identify it. It is the best identified on CT scan of the chest to investigate focal disease. Bronchoscopy is usually indicated to exclude a structural cause. Cystic fibrosis, epidemiology, genetics, and basic defect. CF is the most common life-limiting life autosomal recessive condition in Caucasians with an incidence of 1 in 2,500 live births and carrier rate of 1 in 25. It is well recognized but less common in other ethnic groups. Average life expectancy was increased from a few years to the mid-30s with a projected life expectancy for current newborns into the 40s. The fundamental problem in CF is a defective protein called the CF transmembrane conductance regulator CFTR. This is a cyclic AMP dependent chloride channel found in the membrane of cells. The gene for CFTR located, is located on chromosome 7. Over 900 different gene mutations have been discovered and cause a number of distinct effect, defects in CFTR, but by far the most frequent mutation, about 78% in the UK, is Delta F508. Identification of the gene mutation involved within a family allows prenatal diagnosis and car carrier detection in the wider family. Some genotypes are known to be associated with mild disease and pancreatic sufficiency. However, until recently, the precise genotype had little influence on treatment options. The discovery of CFTR potentiators Ivacaftor and CFTR correctors Lumicaftor have challenged this dogma. 
potentiators are helpful in restoring function of CFTR in class 3 and class 4 mutations, and correctors can partially restore CFTR number in class 2 defects. For example, delta F508. Pathophysiology. CF is a multi-system disorder which results mainly from abnormal ion transport across epithelial cells in the airways. This leads to reduction of the airway surface liquid layer and consequent impaired ciliary function and retention of mucoparian secretions. Chronic endobranchial infection with specific organisms such as Pseudomonas aeruginosa and Seuss. Def defective CFTR also causes dysregulation of inflammation and defense against infection. In the intestine, thick viscid meconium is produced, leading to meconium alias in 10 to 20% of infants. The pancreatic ducts also become blocked by thick secretions, leading to pancreatic enzyme deficiency and malabsorption. Abnormal function of the sweat glands results in excessive concentrations of sodium and chloride in the sweat. Clinical features. All newborn infants born in the UK are screened for CF. Screening reduces diagnosis delay and lowers the risk of presenting with faltering growth or established chronic infection. Immunoreactive trypsinogen IRT is raised in newborn infants with CF and is measured in routine heel prick blood taken from for biochemical screening. Those samples are with a raised immunoreactive trypsinogen are then screened for common CF gene mutations and infants with two mutations have a sweat test to confirm the diagnosis. The majority of children with CF are identified by screening. However, some may still present clinically with recurrent chest infections, faltering growth, or malabsorption. Chronic infection with specific bacteria, initially Staphylococcus aureus and Haemophilus influenza, and subsequently with Pseudomonas aeruginosa or Burgoderia species, results from viscid mucus in the smaller airways of the lungs. This leads to damage to of the bronchial wall, bronchiectasis, and abscess formation. The child has a persistent wet cough, productive of purulent sputum examination that is hyperinflation of the chest due to air trapping or air trapping cause inspiratory crepitations and or expiratory wheeze. With established disease there is finger clubbing ultimately 95% die of respiratory failure. Over 90% of children with CF have pancreatic exocrine insufficiency, lipase, amylase and proteases resulting in maldigestion and malabsorption. Untreated this leads to faltering growth with frequent large pale and greasy stools, theatria. Pancreatic insufficiency can be diagnosed uh, by demonstrating low fecal last days. About 10 to 20% of infants with CF present in the neonatal period with meconium alias, in which inspissated meconium causes intestinal obstruction. Typically, there is vomiting, abdominal distension, and failure to pass meconium in the first few days of life. Surgery is usually required, but gastrographin enema may relieve the obstruction. Diagnosis. The essential diagnostic procedure is the sweat test to confirm that the concentration of chloride in sweat is markedly elevated. Chloride is 60 to 125 uh, millimoles per liter in cystic fibrosis, uh, 10 to 40 millimoles per liter in normal children. Sweating is stimulated by applying low voltage current to pilocarpine applied to the skin. The sweat is collected into a special capillary tube or absorbed into a weight piece of filter paper. Diagnostic errors are common if there is an inadequate volume of sweat collected. Confirmation of diagnosis can be made by testing the gene abnormalities in the CFTR protein. Management. The effective management of CF requires a multidisciplinary team approach. All patients with CF should be reviewed at least annually in a specialist center. The aim of therapy is to prevent proge progression of the lung disease and to maintain adequate nutrition and growth. Respiratory management. Recurrent and persistent bacterial chest infections is the major problem. In young children, respiratory monitoring is based on symptoms. Older children have, should have their lung function measured regularly by spirometry. The FEV1 expressed as a percentage of predict, uh, percentage predicted for age, sex, and height is an indicator of clinical severity and declines with disease progression. With regular treatment, many infants and children with CF will have no respiratory symptoms and often have no abnormal signs. From diagnosis, Children should have physiotherapy at least twice a day, aiming to clear the airways of secretion. In younger children, parents are taught to perform airway clearance at home using chest percussion and postural drainage. Or older, older patients perform controlled deep breathing exercises and use a variety of physiotherapy devices for airway clearance. 
physical exercise is beneficial and is encouraged. Many CF specialists recommend continuous prophylactic oral antibiotics, usually flucoxicillin with additional rescue oral antibiotics for any increase in respiratory symptoms or decline in lung function. Persisting symptoms or signs require prompt and vigorous intravenous therapy to limit lung damage, usually administered for 14 days via PIC, peripheral insertic central line. Increasingly, parents are taught to administer causes of intravenous antibiotics at home to decrease the disruption of school and other activities. Chronic pseudomonas infection is associated with a more rapid decline in lung function, which is slowed by the use of daily nebulized anti-pseudomonal antibiotics. Nebulized DNAs or hypertonic saline may be helpful to decrease the viscosity of sputum and to increase its clearance. The macrolide antibiotic azithromycin given regularly decreases respiratory exacerbations, probably due to the immunomodulatory effect rather than antibiotic action. Regular nebulized hypertonic saline may decrease the number of respiratory exacerbations. More severe cystic fibrosis requires more regular intravenous antibiotic therapy. If venous access becomes troublesome, implantation of a central venous catheter with a subcutaneous access port, portacath, simplifies venous access, although they require monthly flushing and complications may develop. Bilateral sequential lung transplantation is the only therapeutic option for end-stage CF lung disease. Outcomes following lung transplantation continue to improve, with over 50% survival at 10 years. Meticulous assessment, for example, with regard to comorbidities and microbiology, psychological preparation, optimal timing of transplantation, and expert post-transplant care are all essential parts of the multidisciplinary transplant process. Nutritional management. Dietary status should be assessed regularly. Pancreatic insufficiency is treated with oral enteric coated pancreatic replacement therapy taken with all meals and snacks. Dosage is adjusted according to clinical response. A high-calorie diet is essential, and dietary intake is recommended at 150% of normal. To achieve this, overnight feeding via gastrostomy is increasingly used. Most patients require fat-soluble vitamin supplements. Teenagers and adults. Most children with CF survive into adult life. With increasing age, become uh, come increase. With increasing age come increased complications, most commonly diabetes mellitus due to the decreasing pancreatic endocrine function. Up to one-third of adolescent patients will have evidence of liver disease with hepatomegaly on liver palpation, abnormal liver function on blood tests, or an abnormal ultrasound. Regular erso deoxycholic acid to improve flow of bowel may be beneficial. Rarely, the liver disease progresses to cirrhosis, portal hypertension, and ultimately liver failure. Liver transplant is generally very successful in CF-related liver failure. In distal intestinal obstruction syndrome, DIOS, meconeumilis equivalent, visit muco Feculent material obstructs the bowel. This is usually cleared by a combination of oral laxative agents. As the disease progresses, there may be an increasing there may be increasing chest infections as well as other late respiratory complications, including pneumothorax and life-threatening hemoptysis. There is increasing concern over transmission of virulent strains of pseudomonas and Burgdorferia sepestia between patients, causing rapid decline in lung function. Consequently, patients are often segregated and advised not to socialize with with, with other people with CF. Females have normal fertility and unless they have severe lung disease, tolerate pregnancy well. Males are virtually always infertile due to absence of the vas deferens, although they can father children through intracytoplasmic sperm injection. The psychological repercussions on affected children and their families of a chronic and ultimately fatal illness that requires regular physiotherapy and drugs, frequent hospital admissions, and absences from school are considerable. The CF team should provide psychological and emotional support. Adolescents have particular needs, which must receive special consideration. Consideration. Older adolescents with CF should transfer to specialist allowed CF care.
Despite early hopes, gene therapy has not yet proven to be a useful treatment in CF. However, there is considerably there is considerable optimism that CFTR potentiators and CFTR correctors may significantly improve outcomes. The availability of these treatments is currently limited by their high costs. Cystic fibrosis should be considered in any child with recurrent infections, loose stools, or faltering growth. Primary ciliary dyskinesia. In primary ciliary dyskinesia, there is a congenital abnormality in the structure or function of cilia lying in the respiratory tract. Respiratory tract. This leads to impaired mucociliary clearance. Affected children have recurrent infection of the upper and lower respiratory tracts, which if untreated may lead to severe bronchiectasis. They characteristically have a recurrent productive cough, pure nasal discharge, and chronic ear infections. Since ciliary action is responsible for normal organ sinus, 50% have dextrocardia and situs inversus, cardiogenic syndrome, where major organs are in mirror position of normal. The diagnosis is made by examination of the structure and function of cilia and nasal uh, of nasal epithelial cells brushed from the nose. The cornerstones of management are daily physiotherapy to clear secretions, proactive treatments with infections with antibiotics, and appropriate ENT follow-up. Immunodeficiency. Children with immunodeficiency may develop severe, unusual, or recurrent chest infections. The immune deficiency, the immune deficiency may be secondary to an illness, for example, malignant disease, or its treatment with chemotherapy. Less commonly, it is due to HIV infection or a primary immune deficiency. Different types of immune deficiency predispose to different lung infections. IgG deficiency predisposes to infections with polysaccharide capsulated bacteria such as Staphylococcus pneumoniae. Cell-mediated immunodeficiencies make one susceptible to the opportunistic infections such as pneumocystis, girovacci, and fungi, and neutrophil killing defects predisposed to staphylococcal infections. Tuberculosis. Tuberculosis remains an important cause of chronic lung infection. See chapter 15, Infection and Immunity. All children with a persistent productive cough should have a chest x-ray and either a tuberculin skin test or tuberculosis blood test IGRA interferon gamma release assays. Marked hyla or paratrichal tracheal lymph adenopathy is highly suggestive of tuberculosis. Sleep disordered breathing. During REM, REM, rapid eye movement sleep, the control of breathing becomes unstable and there is relaxation of voluntary muscles in the upper airway and chest. This makes upper airway collapse more likely. Sleep disordered breathing occurs either during uh, either due to airway obstruction, central hypoventilation, or a combination of these. Key aspects of the history include loud, loud snoring, witness pauses in breathing, apneas, uh, restlessness, and disturbed sleep. However, symptoms alone are neither a sensitive nor specific marker of actual difficulties. Up to 12% of puber pre-pubertal school children snore, but True estimates of the prevalence of obstructive sleep apnea resulting in gas exchange abnormalities range from 0.7 to 3%. Obstructive sleep apnea leads to excessive daytime sleepiness or hyperactivity, learning and behavioral problems, faltering growth, and in severe cases, pulmonary hypertension. In childhood, it is usually due to upper airway obstruction secondary to adenotonsillar hypertrophy. Predisposing causes of sleep disordered breathing are neuromuscular disease, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, craniofacial abnormalities, for example, Pierre Robin sequence, achondroplasia, uh, dystonia of the upper airway muscles, cerebral palsy, and severe obesity. Children with Down syndrome have anatomically upper airway restriction as well as a hypotonia and particularly are particularly at risk. Though these high risk groups should be screened for sleep disorder breathing. The most basic assessment is overnight pulse oximetry, which can be performed in the child's home. The frequency and severity of periods of desaturation can be quantified. Normal oximetry does not exclude the condition, but means that severe physical consequences are unlikely. Polysonography is required if more com in more complex cases. This should include monitoring of heart rate, respiratory effort, airflow, CO2 measurement, and video recording. This provides more information about gas exchange and can be distinguished between central and obstructive events.
Sometimes more detailed electrophysiological assessment is needed to assess neurological arousals and sleep staging. In children with adenotonsillar hypertrophy, adenotonsillectomy usually dramatically improves their condition. Before surgery for obstructive sleep apnea, overnight oximetry should be performed to identify severe hypoxemia, which may increase the risk of perioperative complications. For children with other sleep-related breathing disorders, nasal or face mask, continuous positive pressure, CPAP or BiPAP, bilevel positive airway pressure to maintain their upper airway may be required at night. Congenital central hypoventilation syndrome is a rare congenital, uh, congenital condition resulting in disordered central control of breathing as well as other autonomic dysfunction. In severe cases, life-threatening hypoventilation occurs during sleep, which may result in death in infancy. Long-term ventilation, either continuous or only during sleep, is the mainstay of treatment. Summary, sleep disordered breathing. The majority are due to adenotonsillar hypertrophy and surgical removal usually dramatically improves symptoms. Tracheostomy. The number of children in all, of all ages with a tracheostomy is increasing. Indications are listed in Table 17.3. If a child with tracheostomy develops sudden and severe breathing difficulties, it may be that the tracheostomy tube is blocked with secretions and needs urgent suctions or needs changing immediately. This does, if this does not relieve the difficulty in breathing, respiratory support is given via tracheostomy tube. All children with tracheostomy should have a spare tracheostomy tube with them at all times and a carer competent to change it. Long-term ventilation. An increasing number of children are receiving long-term respiratory support. Preterm infants with severe bronchopulmonary dysplasia can require additional oxygen for many months. Children with sleep disordered breathing due to neuromuscular diseases such as Duchenne muscular dystrophy will, have, will benefit in both quality and duration of life. Uh, from nocturnal, nocturnal respiratory, nocturnal respiratory support. This requires BiPAP bilevel positive airway pressure, which can be developed non-invasively by a nasal mask or full face mask. Children who have more severe respiratory failure may need 24-hour respiratory support with a tracheostomy. In some severe and progressive conditions such as type 1 spinal muscular atrophy, Difficult ethical decisions need to be made about admission for intensive care and whether to initiate long-term full ventilation. Acknowledgements. That's the end of this chapter.